Good morning and welcome to the Peorian. I'm your host Paul Gordon. A little over eight years ago a Brimfield family suffered what must be one of the most tragic events possible. The suicide of a teenager. Whitney. She was their daughter, their sister, their grandchild, their niece. Outside of her circle of family and friends Whitney was not a familiar name. Her suicide was unremarkable to most people, not only because they didn't know the family, but also because they hadn't lived through such tragedy themselves. Whitney's family and friends wanted to try to keep others from having to live through something similar. That's why they started Whitney's Walk for Life, a walk and also now a 5K run, with the goal of increasing awareness about the third leading cause of death among teenagers, suicide. Whitney's Walk for Life event is now run by the Mental Health America Illinois Valley Organization and proceeds from that event help fund the association's programs that teach signs of depression, the kind of depression that often leads to suicide. That way a child can get the help they need before it is too late. My guests today are officials from Mental Health America Illinois Valley and we're going to talk about Whitney's Walk for Life, which is becoming much better known each year and how we can all help our children and grandchildren after these messages. Welcome back to the Peorian. My guests today are Jamie Sanders and Andre LeMasters from Mental Health America, Illinois Valley. Ladies, welcome to the Peorian. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you for being here. Our subject today is Whitney's Walk for Life. And first of all, the event itself is Saturday, July 28th. Correct. Just a couple weeks from now. And it's at Jubilee State Park. Yes. Jamie, is there still time to participate? There is plenty of time to participate. Okay. Anyone interested can go to whitneyswalk.com and they can register today. Our t-shirt pickups are next week, Friday mm -hmm. night in Broomfield and Saturday from 10 to noon at, at uh, the shops at Grand Prairie. Okay. But you can also pick up your t-shirt that week if you register the very week of. We want everyone who's interested to be there. And it, it includes the walk plus a 5K run, correct? Correct. The 5K will take off at 7.55 a.m. and the walk follows directly after at 8 a.m. Explain to us, if you will, then, and, and maybe we should have done this before, but what exactly is Whitney's Walk for Life? Whitney's Walk was started in 2004 after the death of Whitney Grotz. Whitney was a beautiful 16-year-old girl from Brimfield who died by suicide. And her family and friends decided that they wanted to make something good come out of this awful tragedy. And so they began Whitney's Walk um, and were amazed to raise over $34,000 that very first very year. very first year. Wow. That very first year. And it has increased every year since. Uh, it is certainly the biggest source of funding for the mental health. America and we provide programs um, that address suicide prevention and its main cause depression. And that's where the proceeds from the walk go and yes. other events related to the walk, correct? True. What has happened in the last few years is that teams that have formed in memory of a loved one who died by suicide have taken it upon themselves to raise funds prior to Whitney's Walk that are donated in the name of their loved one. And those events begin in February and go mm. right up until the, the walk itself. Some even happen in the fall, um, but that all, all of that money is credited to Whitney's Walk. What kind of events are those? Oh, it's, it's, it's all sorts of things from golf outings to um, silent auctions to uh, we have uh, one big event that's held with uh, it, kind of in conjunction with Fourth of July with fireworks and the whole, whole deal. It's just everything you could imagine. Okay. Why Jubilee State Park? Jubilee is close to Brimfield and that is where the Gratz family is located. And so it was a natural location for them, but it has really benefited us because if you haven't ever been there, it is a beautiful, beautiful park. And so you're walking through this lush, um, uh, wooded area down this beautiful walk with uh, all kinds of flowers. And it's just, it's just lovely. And it's a great place for the kind of healing that happens at Whitney's Walk. The proceeds that you gain from the walk, not only from the entry fees, but what, do, do participants seek Sponsorship. Sponsorship? Yes, they do. And so a, a huge portion of the amount raised, and last year that was 115000 are donations from individuals. 
And in addition to that, we have businesses who sponsor us. I mean, we accept the, the largesse from anyone who is willing to support this cause. How much has been raised so far in the first, uh, what, eight years? It's over 500000 518000 to be exact. Okay. The family did not, when the family first started it in 2004, it was not affiliated with your organization. No, it correct? was not. Okay, did you help at all on that first? Not to my knowledge, other than the fact that we were supportive of what they were doing. Um, but in the, in the years after that, they came to the Mental Health uh, Association, which was our name at that time, and uh, said, you know, this is something we really support. We want the funds to go towards the programs that you provide. Can we work together? And we have been ever since. Who's actually in charge of it? The well, that would be me. Okay. <laughs> it's Mental Health America that's in charge, and I'm the person at Mental Health America who's charged with that responsibility. Yes. Is the Grotz family still involved? Oh, very much. I could not do this. I mean, we literally have 100 volunteers, and there is a volunteer committee that meets um, monthly starting in March, and the Grotz family is heavily represented on that, on that committee. But also other families that have uh, sadly suffered a suicide since 2004 have asked to get involved, and we give them leadership positions as soon as they are ready and willing to take those on. So the Grotz family did this, I mean, just a mere months after yes. Whitney died. Whitney died in March, and this was done on the last Saturday in July, which, which just happened to be her birthday. Well, it was for her birthday, but it happened to be on the last Saturday in July. And so rather than choosing a particular date each year, we always do it on the last Saturday in July, whenever that falls. Weather means nothing. I mean, no, it's a go. Come rain, come shine. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that We've been what? blessed with good weather the, the two years I've been involved, so I'm hoping for a third. Probably pretty hot, though, isn't it? No, no, it no, no, because at 8 in the morning it really isn't. Yeah. And most of the walkers are done by about 9.30, so it, it really is lovely. Okay. When we come back, we're going to talk about why an event such as this is so important. We're going to discuss teen suicide with Audrey LeMasters, who is a counselor for the Mental Health America when we come back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to The Purian. I'm with Jamie Sanders and Audrey LeMasters of Mental Health America, Illinois Valley. Audrey is a private counselor, but she's also president of the board of Mental Health America, Illinois Valley. Audrey, you're more familiar than most people are about the problem of teen suicide. Why, if you will, mm -hmm. does it seem like teens can't get, can't get past problems and see this as their only resort? Well, I think that there are a lot of struggles as far as accessing um, children, access, accessing services. Um, there's a lot of stigma with mental health, so the idea of talking to their parents about that they're suffering, they're having a difficult time, uh, it's hard to reach out and see a counselor. Oftentimes the teenagers feel that they're broken or um, they've done something wrong, and so it's difficult to, act, to um, access services with teenagers. I think a lot of times, too, it's very difficult for parents because they feel like they've done something wrong. Um, they feel guilty, responsible, so it's hard to admit that their child is having a difficult time. And one of the biggest things I see, too, is that uh, there's a, a perception that all teenagers are moody and have difficult times, and so sometimes the, the seriousness of the issue, um, it's minimized, it's, it's considered to be part of normal childhood, normal teenage development, and unfortunately is overlooked. Is there an age range that seems to be more troublesome? 15 to 24, in that age group, suicide is the third leading cause of right. death. Mm -hmm. Okay. What are some of the most obvious signs then that parents and siblings and friends should be aware of? What, what should they look for? Some of the concerns is being able to look for drastic changes in your teenager, some things that happen um, pretty suddenly over the course of a few weeks. Things like they isolate, they're not um, spending time with their peer group. 
sudden change in um, in their activity levels, not wanting to go out, not feeling motivated or energy energized to do things that they would normally do, participate in hobbies, um, spending more time in their bedroom, seeing a sudden change in their academic performance, perhaps not wanting to go to school, grades dropping, a call from the, the teacher saying they're not performing at school or not participating. Um, other things might be change in sudden change in sleeping and eating habits. So either eating or sleeping more often than normal or uh, less often than normal. Um, drug or alcohol, substance use would be some of the warning signs. And again, to differentiate from normal teenage development, we're talking about things that are pretty sudden, pretty persistent, and uh, occur within a few weeks, over the course of a few weeks. Is it a fallacy that teenagers are, as a rule, moody? Well, I think that there is normal moodiness we all experience. But to assume that your child is um, moody because they're a teenager and overlook these sudden, it's, it's a conglomeration of symptoms. So being able to see this collection of symptoms. And the most important thing is if you are concerned about your teenager, to, to talk about it, ask questions. Uh, let them know that you see these differences and that you're concerned about some, th some changes that are occurring. Uh, many times parents are a little hesitant to talk about particularly um, concerns about suicide or self-harming behavior because they're worried about putting an idea in their head. Yeah. And uh, the unfortunate thing is that by not talking about it, um, you're not putting anything in their head. We're often overlooking um, serious concerns and warning signs. Is there a point that parents should seek professional help rather than trying to take care of what they see as a problem? Absolutely. Any time that your child has exhibited these symptoms for more than a few weeks, you've talked to them, um, tried to make some adjustments, and it doesn't seem to be getting any better, that certainly should be a time to seek help. Um, immediate help should be sought if your child is making statements such as, um, you know, maybe I shouldn't be here anymore, or I wish I didn't wake up tomorrow, or um, uh, you may not see me here again, or but I might, um, I should just kill myself. Things like that would be signs that immediately we would encourage you to seek help. There are also on the Mental Health Association, on Mental Health America on the website, mhaiv.org, there are uh, assessments that people can take. And there's an assessment for parents that they can take if they're concerned about their child. And they can answer the questions at the end of the assessment. It will recommend uh, whether they should seek help, immediate help, and it will give information on how they can seek help. Okay. When we come back, after messages from our sponsors, we're going to talk about helping the surviving family and friends of those who take their own lives. But first here is Kevin Kaiser to talk about what's going on in the literary and culinary world. For nearly 20 years, Americans have been obsessed with reality shows. And one of the most popular genres is cooking. Like becoming a star singer or dancer, it seems that millions of Americans would love to be star chefs and run restaurants, even though it's an absolutely brutal industry, they'd probably fail and they'd be reduced to withering husks. Which, by the way, was a novel by Emily Bronte's younger brother, Stefan. And the interest in all things cooking has bubbled over and created a delicious crispy crust in the world of publishing, where hundreds of new cooking books and books about cooking come out every year. Arguably the most famous of the Kitchen Confidential books is the original Kitchen Confidential, subtitled Adventures in the Culinary by Anthony Bourdain, which was published in 2000 and became a massive bestseller. In the book, Bourdain showed the marinated and baked underbelly of life in a trendy Soho restaurant. The latest Kitchen Confidential book is Restaurant Man by Gordon Ramsay Chef Kick and part-time Legion of Doom member Joe Bastianich. In this recently published memoir, Bastianich charts the course of his culinary life as the son of a famous restaurant man and star chef. At first, Bastianich tried his hand at Wall Street, but that didn't last long. And after a year in finance, he quit the business and went off to Italy where he soaked in the culinary culture. After returning to the States, he partnered with his mother and well-known chef Lydia, along with Mario Batali, to establish one superlative Italian restaurant after another, including America's first four-star Italian restaurant. Like Bourdain, Bastianich writes in a vivid and hard-ass manner about the realities of the restaurant business, like how no bottle of wine costs more than $5 to make. He also reveals the real secret to his success, watching costs but being insanely dedicated to exceeding the customer's expectations on every level and delivering the best dining experience in the world. So that's Restaurant Man by Joe Bastianich, a very interesting insider's look on the New York culinary scene. And if you find yourself interested in books about chefs and restaurants, check out Bourdain's classic Kitchen Confidential, 
or The Devil in the Kitchen, Sex, Pain, Madness, and the Making of a Great Chef by Marco Pierre White, which is one of my all-time favorites. White is a legend in the culinary world, the first true rock star chef, and The Devil in the Kitchen is candid and wickedly funny. Plus, he lays into Gordon Ramsay, which is an added bonus. So there you go. Three great books by three great chefs. Now, in the immortal words of Chef Wife, piss off. We're back talking with Jamie Sanders and Audrey LeMasters about trying to prevent suicide among teens. A little while ago, in an earlier segment, Jamie, you mentioned that suicide is the third leading cause of death among teenagers. Isn't that correct? Those between 15 and 24. I want to go beyond that. Isn't it also like the third leading cause of death among the elderly? It is. I don't know the, the actual rank, but it's 50% higher in elderly than the general population. And that rate is rising every year. Why is that? We are not sure. It may be just the pressure of of life as an elderly person in this country now. I mean, you need to remember that years ago, people didn't live as long as they are now. And they had, you know, they, their retirement savings didn't have to last as long. They didn't live nearly as long without a job, maybe without what they thought was their purpose in life. Life is difficult for many of our senior citizens. And unfortunately, many of them are turning to suicide, and I find that extremely sad. Is it more difficult to recognize the signs among the elderly than it is teenagers? You certainly have to be um, aware of there. There are um, some of the concerns with the elderly is they're much more isolated. They spend a little more time alone, so it might be harder to see the signs of depression. Um, medication, medical concerns sometimes take the emphasis away from dealing with their mental health issues. Okay, I have read that um, among teenagers, that suicide can become almost contagious among teenagers. That, do you get what I'm getting at? That, that mm -hmm. one, a, a, a teenager will commit suicide, their friends will then start thinking about it themselves. If, is that, so is that true, first of all? If there is a suicide in a family, there's more likelihood there will be another suicide in that family. Okay. It certainly is a warning sign. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that why schools are quick nowadays to bring in counselors when a child or a teenager has died? Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Regardless of the cause? Yes. What do we say to our children or our grandchildren when a loved one or a close friend has died, particularly if they took their own life? I think that you have to give them the opportunity. Here again, it's a concern about talking to our children and, um, and hurting them or talking about hurt feelings, and sometimes those get avoided. And then when that happens, then what, the, what that communicates is that it's not okay to talk about it. So the most important thing is that families are willing to sit down and talk about the hard, the hard topic, what happened to their family member or what happened to their friend, and how are they feeling about that, and how are their friends feeling about that, and what is helping them cope. And being willing to talk openly is the most important thing. What can we say to our friends who have lost a loved one? Again, I think it's a very, sim very similar sol solution, is that too many times we don't want to bring up, we don't want to hurt their feelings, we don't want to bring things up that are going to cause them to feel that grief. And ultimately, many times that causes them to feel more isolated. Yeah. Like no one, no one can understand them, no one wants to talk about it, and they feel more isolated. So to be able to talk openly about, and then if they don't want to talk about it, they can let you know. And especially listen. I think yeah. that's the important mm -hmm. thing. So many of my family tell me that the thing that they need most is to be heard. Really? Mm -hmm. Given that, when your child, when you, when you talk to your child about their feelings and your concerns, how do you handle it? How can a parent handle it when a child says, I'm okay, don't worry about it, leave me alone? Mm -hmm. Keep pushing? 
Well, I don't think you, you want to push to be able to let them know that you're there to talk about it. It's important to talk about it. Being able to just sit and talk about how you're feeling, even if they don't want to talk about it, being able to sit and just share your own feelings. Um, I, that's okay if you don't want to talk about it, but I want to share a little bit about how I'm, how I'm coping with it and what helps me and to let you know that it's always okay to come and talk to me about that. It is quite natural, isn't it, for a parent to feel guilty even if the child hasn't committed suicide, but is even thinking about it. If the child is unhappy, isn't it natural for the parent to feel guilty? Absolutely, and scared, and not wanting to tip the boat, not wanting to um, put, put an idea in the child's head that's not already there. And I would just encourage, it's probably there. If you see signs, that you know your child best. If you see signs that tell you to be worried about them, uh, you sh you, we encourage you to talk to them about that. You're not going to put any ideas in their head that aren't already there. If they're already there. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. All right. Ladies, thank you for joining us today and talking about a very difficult subject. Thank you for your We time. appreciate your support. Thank you. And thank you for watching. I hope we've helped bring home the very serious nature of this problem and that it can, in many cases, be prevented if we know what to do. For more information, visit the Mental Health America website at mhaiv.com dot org. Remember you can watch this and previous episodes of the Peoria on our website, thepeoria.com, and tune in next Sunday at 8 a.m. on WHOI TV or on our website for what should be a pretty interesting show. Have a good week.